Okay, so um, thank you to friends for having me and uh, organising this event. Um, as an event on type inference and automated proving, it's sort of a shame that I'll be doing neither. Um, I guess there'll be a little bit of it as, as we go. Um, this is in some sense a follow-on from Bob's talk. So, so uh, Bob talked about... Um, uh, this is not working. Yes, it is. Right. Um, so Bob talked about. <laughs> What's that laser pointer? The, the, the laser pointer doesn't work anymore. Thank right? God. You think you're, you're safe. Um, so Bob talked about um, you know taking taking type checking and, and, and deriving um, kind of a type checking monad. And this talk is is sort of how I tried to write a type checker for a dependently typed programming language and ended up writing a theorem prover instead. Because I sort of started out thinking, well, I want to, I want to re-implement Idris in a way that actually works this time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write the simplest possible type checker I can. And it did turn out that the simplest possible type checker I could write was actually a tactic-based theorem prover. Um, so there you go. Um, so uh, I, this, this is also a little bit of recycled material. I, I talked about this at uh, Scottish Theorem Proving a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm sort of hoping that anyone who's there has forgotten what I said, and therefore this will still be interesting. I've certainly forgotten what I said, so I'll probably fill in different details as we go. Um, so, um, Idris, if you... Hmm? Oh, the logo is new, yes. <laughs> uh, there's a chap, a chap called Heath Johns submitted this. It was very nice, I think. Um, okay, so Idris, if you don't know, is a purely functional programming language. It's sort of... Um, inspired by Haskell and many other things, you know, the epigram and so on. Um, I say that it has uh, first-class dependent types. So when I, when I say first-class types, uh, I mean this in the, in the sense that types are a first-class language construct. So, so you can compute types just like you can manipulate types, just like you can manipulate anything else. This leads to all kinds of nice things you can do with the language, um, which I'm not going to talk about today. What I'm going to talk about today is all the challenges that this gives you when trying to implement one of these things. So uh, I guess I'll just dive straight into it. Uh, by law, if you give a talk about dependent types, you have to show vectors. So I'm going to show vectors. Uh, the reason I show vectors here, actually, is, is, is not so much to sell what you can do with dependent types. Is they, they really do illustrate a lot of the things that you have to figure out while implementing one of these things. So um, this, this thing up top here, this is a kind of GADT style definition of vectors. So, so nil, the empty vector, has nothing in it, zero thing, and, it's, and it's, uh, it, it has some uh, polymorphic element type uh, A. And then cons has the polymorphic element type A, and the tail has K things in it, and the vector has a successor of K things in it. So one thing you might immediately notice here is, what are A and K? I don't appear to have bound them. Um, so they appear to be free. So we call these... Um, unbound implicits. Uh, they are things which are uh, implicit arguments. They are, uh, we are parameterizing over them, indexing over them, but we don't want to have uh, so much noise for the program that the programmer has to explicitly bind all of these things. In the core language, on the other hand, when we elaborate an Idris program, the core language has to know about these things because we have to be able to check these things. So the goal is to have the simplest possible core language. So a core language that we can feed to a tiny kernel and then check programs in that language. And because they've gone through this you know, kernel of about, it's about five or 600 lines of Haskell code, we can be reasonably confident that, uh, that we've done it right. So we're not relying on you know, several thousand lines of, of, of elaboration type checker to, to our programs, right? We're only relying on a few hundred lines of, of, of call. So what we're aiming to do, take our high-level programs and translate them into a core language that supports only uh, data structures and pattern matching functions. So just as an example of, of what a, a real vector looks like in this form, if, if I were to write a, a vector containing just the characters A and B in the high-level language, then uh, this comment here is what I'd write. Uh, and what that translates to in the core is you know, cons of character of successor of zero, and then we finally get the character, and then there's going to be another cons of the character of a zero, and so on and so on. So you can see very quickly you don't want to be writing this. Uh, it gets even worse when we start looking at uh, high-level functions. So 
Uh, we've seen, uh, we've seen uh, zip on vectors already today. Uh, this is a sort of specialized zip that's, that's adding corresponding uh, things in vectors. Uh, you'll notice that we have type classes. So this is, again, inspired by Haskell. Type classes uh, are very nice for overloading things. I like that too much, so I put it in it. Uh, but again, the elaborator has to deal with this. Uh, again, we have the uh, apparently free names, A and N. So we've got these implicit arguments for the names. We also have this implicit type class dictionary that's being cast around. So starting with a program of this form, uh, to get that into the, into the, the, the form that the, the type checker understands, and the type checker can verify is well typed, uh, first thing we're going to do is make the implicit arguments explicit. Right, we're going to add them. So, so we're, we're explicitly binding the A now, we're explicitly binding the N. So this, this underscore means I don't know yet. We'll, we'll fill this in. And you'll also notice that the type class is now an explicit argument. So type classes are represented uh, just as uh, data structures. Uh, this has the amusing effect of making type classes first class, by the way. So you can, you can parameterize type classes on all sorts of things. Um, so you, you, know, dependent type. you can have dependent type classes. That, in fact, we shouldn't really call them type classes. We should call them classes, except that confuses people who do object-oriented programming. <coughs> you can parameterize them on type classes if you really want to, which is leads to all kinds of entertainment. Why do you know that A and N are in that order? Uh, you don't. Um, uh, the machine actually <laughs> figures that out. Good. So the, the, the machine will add the name when it encounters it, and then it will reorder them as necessary, um, in theory. Uh, you, get, you get a mysterious no such variable error if not. Um, I believe I've fixed that one. Um, yeah, yeah, OK. So, so you might have, I mean, if, if you're parameterizing over a vector, for example, that vector has a length, and that length doesn't appear anywhere. So that's the sort of, so you have to, you have to deal with these things. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that here. Uh, this is really just to give you an idea of what the call looks like. So you'll notice that I've given the type class dictionary an explicit name here that we're feeding in. Uh, so the next step, the elaborator is going to have to figure that, figure out what's in these, uh, what's in those codes, what, what, what those implicits actually are. So you'll see that this type class dictionary is, is getting fed through, for example. You'll see that uh, the, the length is explicitly successor of k here and then k here, uh, and so on. So we still haven't bound, in, in these clauses, we still haven't bound these names. So eventually what comes out, and, and you know, this is, uh, you, you can now look at when you're, when you elaborate an address program, you can look at what the core representation is. And if you, if you ask the system, you'll see something a bit like this. You'll, you'll see that the patterns have been explicitly bound everywhere. Um, all the arguments are explicit everywhere. So this is something that you can feed to a type checker. The type checker doesn't have to do anything clever at all. Um, it just has to implement well, a type checker for a dependently type call language. Um, and in theory, that's all you need to know that you have a proof. But you obviously don't want to write this. So, um, Idris programs have lots of high-level constructs. <coughs> Although we're going to end up in TT, which is just these pattern matching definitions and just, uh, just data type definitions. So, I mean, essentially what you've seen there, by example, is all of TT. There is, there is, there is no more to it than that. We have to get there somewhere from our high-level programs. Why it's called TT, by the way? Um, that just happens to be what the uh, core data structure was called. And when I, when I needed a name for it, I just ended up casually writing TT. We have since decided that TT looks a little bit like a capital PI, and therefore TT is a good name for it. Um, so we've got where clauses, we've got ways of inspect inspecting implicit arguments, so all these have to get translated somehow to top level pattern matching definitions. Um, we allow incomplete terms. So I, I practice what I uh, like to call. Um, uh, type-driven development, which is abbreviated to TDD, which is not at all confusing. Uh, and TDD allows you to, <laughs> type-driven development, allows you to have you know, incomplete programs where you say to the type checker, what is the context of this? What is the type I'm looking for? Uh, so we can have, we can, the, 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 the elaborator has to be able to deal with that, to, to deal with things where it doesn't know the value, but it does know the types that would fill it in. Types might also be left just locally implicit. So, um, like you don't want to put types on lambdas, you don't want to put types on, uh, on let binding. So I guess I am doing type inference in some sense here. Uh, so we want to, we, we, while we have top level types for everything, we'll try to infer as much as possible as, as, as we go. 
Um, okay, so I set about trying to write this type checker. Uh, realized eventually that this was too hard, and what I should be doing is, is writing a, a tactic based theorem prover. So the observation is that uh, um, if you're familiar with uh, you know, Koch as opposed to Agda for theorem proving, if you're writing uh, proofs in Koch, probably what you do is start with the type. And by a series of, of tactics, you will, you will refine your proof so eventually you reach uh, the goal type. Whereas if you're writing a proof in Agda, for example, or Haskell, um, you prefer to write in a pattern matching style. So it's a, it's, a, it's a nice abstraction for humans. So a human can look at your pattern matching program and read it and see, what is, see what's going on. Whereas um, if you happen to be a machine, um, it's quite nice to... Um, write a program sort of by refinement, by, by repeatedly applying tactics, but you know, a human's going to look at that and not know what's going on. So uh, the idea here then, the observation here, is that we, we use the high-level program structure not as a thing that we type check directly, but as a thing that will direct tactics or, uh, uh, to build TT programs by repeated application of tactics. So in some sense, your high-level program is nothing more than a composite tactic that will get you to a goal. So, uh, Idris is uh, implemented in Haskell. We've essentially ended up with a tactic engine, uh, like a, a monad, a tactics monad, a theorem proving monad, or the elaboration monad, implemented in Haskell. So throughout this talk, I'm gonna have, or the rest of this talk, there's gonna be a little bit of language confusion. <coughs> there's gonna be a little bit of Haskell, a little bit of Idris, getting into TT. Uh, there's a visual cue here. I'm going to distinguish Haskell programs by font. This is the Haskell font. <laughs> you recognize the Haskell font. I'm going to call this the Haskell font from now on. Um, so to elaborate terms, we've, we've got this Elab monad, and we've got a sort of system monad. So Idris, the Idris monad is the catch-all, catch-everything monad. Um, and you'll see a few things just from these two uh, types. Well, firstly, I should say, this is the idealized version. The real world is not quite so simple as, as, as the idealized version that I'm presenting. But you'll get a general idea of a bird's eye view of what's going on. Um, so to build something, we'll build, to build a term, we will take a P term. So this is, um, I can't remember why I called it P term. Um, parse term, I think. So this is the high-level representation that has simply been parsed from what you know, user programmer has uh, have written. Uh, and that p-term will hopefully, so this, this p-term here really is the tactic. This is the high-level tactic. <coughs> and what will come out, if we're lucky, of elaboration is a term. So this is what I call term here, that is the representation in TT. Um, and to do that, we'll run um, we'll run a specific elaborator for the particular thing we're trying to do. So we might be elaborating a pattern or elaborating a right-hand side or elaborating a type. All of these are slightly different things. And we'll feed in the name of the thing we're elaborating. We'll feed in its type. Uh, so everything is type directed here. Type's going first, so the type is the plan. So we'll feed in the type, we'll feed in a particular elaborator, and that elaborator then has access to a goal type at each stage. Uh, and what will eventually come out is hopefully an elaborated version of the thing we fed in and we might update the system stage while we're at it. So just a few, the, uh, a few of these things will crop up um, as we go. So we'll see the Elab monad. Uh, we'll certainly see uh, term and type. So term and type are actually the same thing. So internally, they are just TT programs. I call them term and type as, as synonyms just because it gives, again, it's a kind of a visual cue as to what's going on here, whether this, intent, this, is, this thing I'm talking about is intended to be right of a colon in a type of judgment, uh, and so on. Okay, so uh, we have, this is probably the most important thing, uh, the most important part of, of Idris elaboration is, is uh, the monad, the Elab monad. And that monad uh, will contain, as we go, just the current, everything about the current proof state. So everything about the program we're building, the things we still have to do, the problems we still have to solve, the variables that are, that, that are in scope, and, and, and so on. So it will contain the current proof term. That current proof term, as we're working through the program, uh, might contain holes. So these are bits of the program that we haven't yet elaborated. So like if we're applying a function application, we might elaborate a function, but we still have a hole for the argument, and so on. Uh, it will contain 
Unsolved unification problems, so this has been mentioned a couple of times already today. Uh, when you, as you're elaborating a, a program, you might solve some of the goals by unifying one thing with another. And there are three possible things that can happen if you unify two things. It might fail completely, so it might, it might say, no, this is never going to work. Like you're trying to unify true with false, obviously that's, that's never going to work. It might succeed, so if you're, if, you're, if you're unifying true with x, then we now know that x is true, this is good. Or you might not know yet. So we might be unifying true with, um, I don't know, we might know, we might, be, we might be unifying f of true with uh, false, in which case, well, we don't know anything until we've solved f, so we, we sort of defer that sort of problem. <coughs> so if we get a unification problem that we can't solve immediately, we defer that and we make a note of it and we come back to it as we progress through time check. Um, so one thing, I, I don't know if, if, if Bob's system would cope with this idea of focus. So we have, we have lots of different things that were type, that lots of different subterms that we might want to uh, type check next. And it's quite handy to be able to move around. Like we, if we're trying to um, resolve a type class, say, but we can't resolve it yet, like we don't know, we don't have enough information to resolve it yet, we might decide that we want to try elaborating a function argument first, so we can focus on that argument and then come back to the type class. So this is this is a handy thing to have to be able to say, okay, that's that's the subterm I want to do next. Uh, and we also have access to the global context. So that's basically all the modules we've imported, all of the definitions we have access to. Uh, so within that, we have a few primitive operations. Again, some of these might look familiar from earlier. So um, we have the ability to type check a chunk of, of TT. So, so raw is a representation of TT that has not yet been type checked. And that will give us back, if we're lucky, if it succeeds, it will give us back uh, the type check term and its type. Um, so notice we don't feed in the type here. Um, the, 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 we, we're sort of bi-directional, except we're feeding in the type right at the top level, and, and the elaborator may make use of that as it, as it needs to be. But type checking itself, uh, purely checking. Um, um, so should that function be called check? Um, what would you call it? Insert. Ah, uh, good point, yeah. yeah. Or even elab itself. Uh, well, it's, 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 it's not doing any elaboration here, really, because it's not filling in any implicit, it's not doing any unification. Really, it, all it's doing is turning the raw thing into a pair of term of type. Uh, I think I, I was explicit about this earlier, but elab, um, things in elab can fail. And, and if something in elab fails, then the whole thing fails. And you know, you'll get a hopefully useful type error that says why it failed, a type error. Can I just ask, since when you call run a lab, you push a type in. Yes. Is it possible for an elab process to ask for that type? Yes. <laughs> so, um, and we very often do that. So, um, yeah, so we have a few useful things. So we can normalize things, we can unify things. Unifying things will give us back a list of the things it's, it's, it's succeeded with. Um, it may actually, this, this is not, this is sort of, not strictly just a pretty like a querying operation. This might update the elaborator state. It might try solving other unification problems. Um, but but you know, what it will come back with is a list of the things it solved. So while we're elaborating things, it is quite handy to know the current thing we're trying to do, so the type of the current subcode. Um, so one feature that Idris has is sort of ad hoc type directed overloading. So overloading doesn't necessarily have to be in a type class. Like you might have, you might have a lookup function that works on lists and vectors, for example. Um, so being able to look at the goal gives you a chance of knowing which of these uh, functions you, uh, uh, you, you need. Also, we have um, for lazy evaluation, we have or for, for lazy expressions, we have laziness as a type. So again, if you see that the type of something is lazy, then you know implicitly you need to insert it lazy. So this allows us to infer quite a lot of program that you'd otherwise have to write explicitly. So because the elaborator always has access to the type of the current thing it's looking at, uh, it can use that information to, well, save you writing some of your program. Um, other things, I mean, there's, there's, there's all kinds of things that we can have access to. So getN gets us access to the current context, for example. 
get proof term, get us access to like the current state of, of what we're trying to do. Um, so all, all of the things that are in the state, we can have access to um, if need be. Um, and then finally, um, we have tactics. So these things, if uh, you, you may be familiar with, some of these may look a little bit like they might well, not be out of place in a, in, in a cop proof, so we can focus on things, we can, we can claim that some method variable exists and sort of suggest a type for it, um, we, can, we can suggest an exact proof for the current goal, and so on. Right, so, um, yeah, we've, we've written this in Haskell, so we can use all of Haskell, so you know, we, can, we can try various combinations, and essentially what we end up with is this elab monad is a a monad for, or a language, or even an embedded DSL for constructing your own uh, uh, interesting tactics. And you can, you know, being, being an embedded DSL, we can have all of Haskell here. Um, and you can think of that as, as a way of writing proof scripts. And uh, actually now, so this wasn't the case last time I gave this talk, um, this, this eLab monad has, has now been exposed <coughs> to the Idris program by a reflection mechanism. So uh, David Christiansen has been working on this over the last little while. He did say that if I mentioned that in this talk, I had to put a huge disclaimer on it and say, you know, don't use this for anything important. Um, if, if you're using Idris for anything important, you know, I don't know. Um, but it, it's, it's because we have this machinery there, you might as well give, it, give the programmer access to it, allowing the programmer to write their own tactics for whatever, uh, whatever domain you happen to be working in. Uh, okay, so I'd like to give just a couple of examples of how this works in practice. Um, so just a couple of high-level language features and show how they turn into tactic scripts. So imagine you have an append function. So a vector of length n, a vector of length m, and outcome of a vector of length n plus m. It's got these three implicit arguments, a, n, and m, which the programmer has decided they're not interested in giving up because it's too boring to write them down. So we see an application nil plus one comes two comes nil. What does the machine do? Um, so you can write this program in the form of a tactic script. Uh, this is as much as Bob was doing earlier. Um, so we'll say, well, let's, let's invent something called A, which is a type, invent something called N, which is a NAT, something called M, which is a NAT. So we've just claimed that these things exist. We haven't said anything about what they are. This is going to introduce some uh, meta variables that the inference procedure has to solve. Same for X's and Y's. So we've now got N, and, N M, and A are now in scope, so we can use um, we can use N and M when we're making these claims. I've actually simplified this slightly because obviously you're going to have to elaborate this, uh, this vector too. Uh, you can tell by the font, of course, that this is this program. Um, once we have all of these things, we can apply the function to the things that we've just invented. So, so we're applying plus plus to A, N, M, X's and Y's. I haven't said anything about what these things are yet, just that they exist. So they're now in scope, but they don't have a value. Um, then I'll focus on the two subterms that I do know about. So I know about I know what x is, is going to be, it's nil. I know what y is, is going to be, it's one comes two comes nil. I'll focus on these two things and elaborate them recursively. Cross my fingers and hope that that has given the system enough information to infer the other arguments. To, to through unification, fill out what those other arguments are. So nothing inside the system is going to check that that's happened, except that if there wasn't enough information, we'll get to the end, and there'll still be a hole. And if there's still a hole, we'll report an error and say, you need to give me more information. So every time we call apply, every time we elaborate a subterm, uh, the machine is going to be running the unify operation to see if it can figure out what the gaps are. So in general, um, and this is what the address elaborator itself does, um, you'll type to apply a function to some arguments, you'll type check the function, that will tell you what the types are. We'll make claims for each of those arguments. Um, then we'll apply the function to those arguments. Then for every argument that we know about, so the ones we don't know about are called placeholders, just holding it as a gap. Um, for every non-placeholder argument, uh, we'll focus on it and recursively elaborate and, fingers crossed, that's going to be enough. Uh, so for... Um, so, is your sort of putting functions in as 
his normal form in the course of elaborating them. That's uh, a very reasonable way of putting it, yes. So for function types, just another example of a high level feature, it's the only other one I'll do. So we've got for all n in net, give us a vector of n int. Um, we'll, we'll invent something for the type. Uh, we'll say that there is an n which has that type that we've just invented. We'll then focus on that type we've just invented and elaborate it, and then we'll elaborate the scope. And again, fingers crossed, that's enough we need, enough, enough, that's all we need to get us to a fully elaborated program. And if it's not, we'll report that back to the program. Um, so in general, this is what we do, invent the type, elaborate it, elaborate the scope. Um, obviously we need to do declarations too, so we need to do data declarations, we need to do function declarations, but every one of these declarations that we, that we build, what we have to do is call the appropriate elaborator for uh, the terms and then glue them together. So, so for a top level function declaration, we elaborate the type just using that elab monad that I showed you, uh, elaborate the left hand side. And when we elaborate the left-hand side, there'll, there'll be lots of pattern variables, and those pattern variables haven't been found at that point. We'll get to the end, and we'll find that there are a lot of holes left over. Those holes are the pattern variables. So, and we know their types at that point because it's been inferred. So out come the pattern variables, and we'll use that information to elaborate the right-hand side. Um, and it's quite fun that this all just drops out. We don't have to do any work for this to happen. It just, it's just there in the proof state. So the trick is to look at the proof state, see what we've got, uh, and use it. We probably ought to do some things like check that the left-hand side and right-hand side really didn't have the same type, you know, various things like that to make sure that we're well typed. Um, if we've got where clauses, it's really not that much more difficult. Um, so when we elaborate the left-hand side, we now know what's in scope, because that's what the holes were. So we update the functions in the where clause to well, basically parameterize them over those things that we've just discovered. Call that elaborator, that top level elaborator recursively. We don't even need to know that we're in a where clause at that point. We just get on with it. Once it's done, go back to the right hand side. Um, so again, surprisingly straightforward. A little bit fiddly, but in principle, quite straightforward. Um, final thing, because I'm slightly out of time, is type classes. So type classes have, it turns out, a pretty direct translation to data, data types and pattern matching functions. So we've got a high level address program here for the, the show type class. So this, is a, this turns into a data declaration, this turns into a function declaration. Uh, pretty much like this. So the data declaration is show, we've got a constructor that says we are a show instance, that show instance contains the method, and then our top level show function, all we have to do is extract the appropriate method and run it. And then to make an instance, essentially what we've done is take this definition of show and, and do a bit of you know, copy paste work to generate the type and, and copy that uh, show function in. And that's, that's pretty much all the elaborator has to do to give us type classes. Uh, we do have to resolve the type classes when it comes to. Um, uh, you know, if, when, while we're elaborating, there will be holes where the type class dictionary has to go. Well, guess what we do? We write a tactic. We write a tactic that solves that hole by looking for the appropriate type class instance. Um, and it is just, I hate using the word just, but to, to here I really am going to just use the word just. We just call that tactic and out comes the appropriate, if it's there, uh, type class instance. So by doing, by doing elaboration in this style, by having a, a, a tactic system where we, for every language construct, we work out what sequence of tactics to use, and then for every uh, high-level declaration construct, we work out how to translate it into either a data declaration or a function declaration, it turns out to be pleasingly straightforward to add new language features, almost dangerously straightforward to add language features, so we add them. And then we realized it was a bad idea in the second manner. Um, so as long as you can work out how to turn that declaration into either you know, data or function, then you've won. So that's what we did. 
so there's more on this. All the gory details are in a, a JFP paper from about last December. Um, uh, so all this and more. Um, but meanwhile, I hope that's been e enough to uh, get you hacking on the Idris language, or at least let you know how things work underneath. Thank you. Um, how kind of stable do the these tactics tend to be? Because I know in COP, for example, uh, if one small change happens to the proof state, then the whole rest of the LTAC just doesn't work. Yeah, but the thing is, these tactics are invoked by the machine, not the programmer. And the only th all that the programmer is doing is writing a high-level program which will invoke the appropriate underlying tactic. Now, we do expose that um, to some extent um, for writing you know, your own decision procedures or whatever. But then, it's, it's not the application programmer who has to worry about this. It's the library developer. However, the other answer is quite stable. We, we don't really feel the need to fiddle with it very much. Uh, the real problem is if, you're, if you change the structure of your program slightly, the proof itself might change. But of course, then that's when you really do want automated tactics to, to get you to the, end, the, the answer. So, if you want to change the surface syntax and add tactics, is, is that all possible to do? Uh, again, we've done that, but the, the problem with having done that is that we use it. And I really wish they wouldn't. Uh, you know, they come along and say, why don't you have a tactic to do this, that, or the other? And I have to say, well, that's not the point of tactics. So you can do that. It is quite handy if you're you know, for debugging, really, to be honest. Um, so you know, once you have the tactics underneath, you might as well at least expose them for developers. Um, so, yeah, why not? Yeah. Channeling my inner Benjamin Pierce. <laughs> to, to what extent is the design for this implementation parametric in the TT? Um, I don't. I want to write a type system for a language, and then I want your machinery to build me a type check as well. Um, I think that really depends on the quality of my implementation. Okay. Uh, I would like to think that you could change the, the, the underlying theory and the tactics would still work. I'm, in fact, I'm pretty sure that's true. Uh, how easy that is is really a function of the quality of my implementation. And yeah, we like to play with alternative languages. Right? Maybe someone wants to implement Hobotopi type theory, for example, as a, as a core. And yeah, they're welcome to do that. <laughs> Maybe you have one question. Both showed us the elaboration of type classes and instances, and I believe that it is just named instances. Does it change anything for the elaboration? Is this the same as the program? Um, so, Type class resolution doesn't look for named instances. So named instances, by the way, you'll notice that this, this show nat has, has a name instance show nat. These names are normally machine generated. You can generate multiple instances and give them names, and this annoys Haskell programmers because it makes resolution incoherent. Um, but, you know, there you go. Um, but to repeat after me, Idris is not Haskell. So, yeah. On a small question on this slide, um, the show K at the end, uh, is that, that shadowed the... Yeah, I've the sort end. of, is that, I've, I've hidden a little, in fact, we, hmm, which, which show is this? It's, it's this show. I've been a bit naughty, I've used this show. Uh, it's, it's the most recent one. I should probably have given these different names, but I didn't. So, so there you go. But yes, it, uh, this, this, this show here is considered to be the top level thing, which means, of course, you can have that invoking different instances if you want. Um, so, yeah, this should really be show, well, yeah. <laughs> the three on the left yeah. and the one after show it, before the where. It's, it's rather unfortunate the that they the have the same name in the surface syntax, and I've reflected that in the elaborated syntax, whereas they are different shows here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.